Well, good evening, everyone. God bless you. What a, what a blessing to be connecting with you once again through technology. And we're just uh, so excited about tonight. And it's um, one, one of the downsides, obviously, is that we can't be in each other's presence. But uh, in light of the times in which we're living and our, our uh, social experiences, yeah, this is good. We're going to do our best with it. And we are obviously going into worship. Um, so we appreciate you being with us tonight. And we're going to do something a little different um, after I open with prayer and uh, then the uh, program will officially begin. But tonight uh, as well, we're going to attempt as best as we can to give you an opportunity to interact with each of the speakers tonight. And what it means is that um, just one or two of you will be able to perhaps um, share a question or a thought. And obviously, because of the time, we, we are asking that you be very, very circumspect with your time. No long, drawn out, questions and thoughts, but get to the point, and if you have a question, maybe some of you can uh, put it on chat to let Mike know that you, you do have a question uh, once once each speaker has finished, or perhaps you'll, you'll just raise your hand, and Mike will see your hand, and he'll give you access to the, uh, to the mic. So um, do your best, and obviously uh, what Mike will do, if it gets too long, he's going to Shut your mic off. <laughs> so, so do your best <laughs> to uh, fit within the uh, framework of, of uh, perhaps, uh, I think, yeah, I, I think it was said uh, maybe 20 seconds, 15, 20 seconds. Get your question out there uh, so that we can respond because um, we're, we're extending the service till about 7.30. So we, we don't want to go too far beyond uh, what is normal. But we are so grateful that you're here. And yet at the same time, we, we're not we're gonna do our best not to let the technology get in the way of our worship. So you know, we're we're learning, we're learning how to do this and get better at it. But we do appreciate your patience with us as well. So with that, let's uh, let's go into prayer and let's go into the presence of God together and invite him to um, one to make his presence known but also prayerfully he'll enjoy the offering, the sacrifice of our lips and praise. Father, we are grateful to be in your presence, and we acknowledge again the wonderful privilege that we have as your people, as people who've been redeemed. Uh, we celebrate your son, the Lord Jesus, and what he did uh, some 2,000 years ago, and we still have not gotten over it. We are still yet yet in amazement of your great love for us. Thank you so much for this gathering tonight through Zoom. Thank you for the technology. And yet we pray that uh, beyond the technology, we will know the glory of God as we open the word, as we worship, by way of song, by way of uh, text, of scripture, reading, and by way of sharing the word. Be glorified. And uh, we thank you again and ask these things in the name of our wonderful Savior, Jesus. Amen. You never change. You are the God you say you are When I'm afraid You come and still my beating heart You stay the same When hope is just a distant thought You take my pain And you lead me to the cross What love is this that you gave your life for me and made a way for me to know you and I come 
confess your ways enough for me. You all I need. I look to you. I see the scars upon your hands and hold the truth. But when I can't, you always can. And standing here beneath the shadow of your cross, I'm overwhelmed. But I keep finding open arms. What do I? Is this that you gave your life for me and made a way for me to know you? And I confess you're always enough for me. You're all I need. Jesus, in your suffering, you were reaching, you all of me. Jesus, in your suffering, you were reaching, you thought of me. What love is this that you gave your life for me and made a way for me to know you? And I confess your is enough for me. Saints, I pray all are all is well with you all. Um, it's a wonderful day. It's a brand new day that the Lord allowed us to take part of. Um, but I want to encourage you all. I, I know that these are trying times um, dealing with the coronavirus. But remember, the Lord knows what we're going through. He knows a little bit about suffering as well as our suffering. So I just want to encourage you all. Um, I pray that you all will take um, the words of the Lord um, in your hearts and take them with you as you go. And um, also, I just wanted to let you all know that uh, most of man and know, but if there are any other people that are viewing or watching or listening, my name is Pastor Gerald. And I'm one of the pastors at Manor Bible Baptist. But I wanted to start off, um, first of all, to say that, again, the Lord is very much concerned about the coronavirus and what we're going through. But Jesus is very aware of the things that we are going through. And I want to start off with prayer. Dear Lord, I just thank you, Lord, for this brand new day that we've never seen before. And Lord, and I just thank you, Lord, for each family, each uh, person that's available, that's listening or hearing. 
Um, Lord, I pray that you would just richly bless them and anoint them with your word. Um, Lord, and I pray, Lord, that uh, even though these are trying times, that we will lean totally on you, Lord. Um, again, you know about our suffering. Um, Lord, I pray for any family member, Lord, who has lost a loved one um, regarding uh, or uh, because of the coronavirus. Um, I pray for the family members, Lord, who have buried or um, who have lost family members, Lord. I pray for those that are sick. I pray for healing for your bodies, Lord, as well. Um, and Lord, and I just pray, Lord, that your word will not return void, Lord, that it will be a blessing to your heart and your soul. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, well, I'm going to do one of the seven last words. It's the first of the seven last words. And when you all get a minute, if you can turn to Luke with me, uh, that's chapter 23. And that's verse 32. And if you will read with me, there were also two others, criminals, led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, Forgive them, for they do not know what they do. So I, I want to share with you all today regarding that. Um, again, um, the Lord is concerned about what we're going through. Um, he also gave his life for sinners saved by grace. But the unfortunate thing, many don't and won't acknowledge him. And remember, saints, Christ paid an awesome price, and it grieves him that many will not follow him. Jesus created the world for his glory. In fact, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3 states that he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Amen. And also, after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus' glorious brightness comes from being essentially divine. Jesus is the express image. He is the son of and the exact representation of God's being because he is God himself. And that's Colossians chapter one, verse 15. But saints, what I want you to remember and hold close to your heart, that this world is not our eternal home. That is the comfort of knowing Christ and why he suffered for us. But just to give you a little um, history about what is going on, um, and Luke chapter 23, verse 1, um, it starts to get into the questioning um, of Jesus by Pilate. Um, and, and I just wanted to tell you a little bit about crucifixion and what our Lord went through. But crucifixion at the time of Jesus' death was considered the most painful and degrading form of capital punishment in the Roman Empire. It was considered so horrible that it was used by the Romans only for slaves and the lowest types of criminals. And can you imagine our Lord Jesus Savior endured incredible pain? So saints, he does know about suffering. And again, to give you a little bit of the history, the entire council and Sanhedrin is what they call the council, had difficulty with the claim that Jesus was the son of God. The Jesus uh, leaders sensed that Jesus was claiming great authority, that Jesus was equal to God, which he was. And if you all would also turn to me, again, we're just going to go through a little bit of hit the history. Um, chapter uh, Luke chapter 22 and that's verse 66. 
And we're going to read 66 through 71. Again, that's 22, chapter 22, and that's verse 66 through 71. And I'm going to give you a minute to get that scripture. Okay, verse 66 reads, As soon as it was day, the elders of the people, both chief priests and scribes, came together and led him into their council, saying, If you are the Christ, tell us. Now, here, from Jesus' own mouth, he says, that the Jewish leadership concluded that Jesus had made a confession of guilt. Now, what he was guilty of, that, uh, that bears question. And it also says, but he said to them, if I tell you, you will by no means believe. And if I also ask you, you will by no means answer. Answer me or let me go. So the accusations began uh, in chapter 23. The Roman ruler, Pilate, was responsible for collecting taxes. However, the supposedly crimes that Jesus were accused of were perverting the nation and forbidding payment of taxes to Rome. And the most severe was the claiming to be the Christ. And then further, in chapter 23 of Luke, verse 3, Pilate asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? And he said this to Jesus. But Jesus gave Pilate the same qualified reply he gave the St. Adrian. It is as you say. So Pilate said to the chief priests in the crowd, I find no fault in this man but he is not a threat to Rome. But in chapter, uh, in John chapter 18, verse 36 through 38, John chapter 18, 36 through 38, Jesus pointed out that his kingdom is not of this world. Jesus also pointed out that though he was king, he was no threat to Rome because his kingdom would not come by a worldly revolution. Saints, again, this world is not our eternal home. So we should prepare for our heavenly home. Amen? So if we go down to chapter 23 of Luke, verse 23, it shows the suffering, the great suffering of our Lord. And, you know, we, we have to remember that this was at a cost. It was at a, a ultimate cost that he went through all of these things for me and for you. But again, chapter 23, verse 23 states, but they were insistent, demand, demanding with loud voices that he be crucified. And the voices of these men and of the chief priests prevailed. Saints, my Savior was whipped, physically embarrassed, and for me, and for many of you, over 2,000 years ago, he was bruised for my iniquities. Yes, my Lord understood what it meant to suffer. Not for anything that he done, but what he experienced, Calvary, for me. And I'm sorry for making this personal because it's, it's about me and it's about many of you. So saints, he was whipped with bits of metal attached to the whip that they scourged him with. He was stripped naked. He was laid on the ground with the cross beam under his shoulders. And people, in case some of you didn't know, 
that when they nailed the criminals to the cross, it made them die just that much quicker. Oh, my Lord, what my Lord went through. But it was at a cost. You and I didn't have to pay that cost. Jesus Christ paid that cost. When he not only died on the cross, but he rose on the third day for me. Hallelujah. And, you know, we cannot take this crucifixion lightly because we sin and then we contemplate forgiveness. And then we are so hot and cold. We're Lord, Lord, one day and the next day many of us are sinning. Many times those that are not Christians, they don't see Christ in us. And my Lord, I, I, I pray that that's not any of us. And they don't see Christ in us because we are so hot and cold many times. We soon forget the nail scarred prince. We soon forget the suffering of Jesus Christ and the awesome price that he paid. Isaiah 64, 6 says, all of us have become like one who is unclean and all our righteous acts are like rat, rig, uh, filthy rags. All of our righteous acts are like filthy rags. But actually we're nothing. We're nothing. If we're nothing but filthy rags, who do we think we are to think that we are just indispensable? that we can do whatever we want to do. Church, I am forgiven because Jesus paid the price when he gave his life for me. I'm forgiven because all of the chains have been broken and now he rose from the grave with all power in his hand. Jesus has given us power to overcome sin. Hallelujah. Luke 23, 24, I'm sorry, Luke 23, 34 states, then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Saints, let us remember the price that Christ paid on Calvary. Don't let us take his resurrection lightly. He gave us a purpose to live for him and to live righteously. So Lord, I pray that you all will continue to seek the Lord's face, continue to read our word, Lord, continue to tell others about Christ and that we will live the life that you died for, that you willingly died for this painful death, Lord, for us, Lord. Lord, I thank you for manna. I thank you for every opportunity to share your word, Lord, your precious word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The crossroads at the cross of Jesus. Luke 23, 43. And Jesus said to him, Surely I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. The day that Jesus, the day that Jesus was crucified, on the cross that first Good Friday, as we Christians refer to it, many unusual events were occurring. At one point during that day, the world was cast into total darkness for three hours. The veil in the Jewish temple, which divided the Holy of Holies from the holy place and was four inches thick, was ripped from top to bottom. Mark fifteen thirty seven records it this way. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice, and breathed his last. Then the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. So when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. And this Roman centurion made an observation that day. He came to a conclusion. Jesus was the son of God. He was at a crossroad and he made that observation. Jesus was God. 
another event that happened that day, there was an earthquake. That's recorded in Matthew 27. Many saints came out of the grave and walked through the Jerusalem that day. That's also recorded in Matthew 27. And today, this Good Friday, we're experiencing unusual circumstances. We're enduring a worldwide pandemic, and many people are dying as a result of being infected with the coronavirus. Many are facing a crossroad, and a vital decision must be made. Pilate, the Roman governor, who presided over the trial of Jesus was at a crossroad. He had to make a vital decision. The one standing and observing the crucifixion were at a crossroad. And the thieves who were cru crucified with Jesus were at a crossroad. They had to make an important decision. Why did the son of, the son of, of God, Jesus, subject himself to a tortuous death by being hung on a Roman cross? We as Christians believe that God the Son allowed himself to die a humiliating death, for he being God did not have to endure this humiliation. He had the power to escape it. In comparing all four of the gospel accounts that record the crucifixion of Christ, Jesus had two main charges against him. Luke 23 verse 1 reads like this, then the whole multitude of them arose and led him to Pilate, and they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ, a king. So the first charge was he was refusing to pay taxes to Caesar, or he was refusing to pay his taxes to the Roman Empire. And many, is, uh, just like today, many have, do not pay their taxes. Uh, at one point in Luke uh, chapter 20, verse 22, the scribes and the Pharisees came to him and asked, is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? And a few verses later, Jesus said, render therefore to, Jesus, to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Second charge, so Jesus clearly believed that he should pay his taxes. The second charge, that he claimed to be God which according to Jewish law was blasphemy and was worthy of death. Um, both of these charges, I believe, from study of scripture, were motivated by Satan and were only a means to have Jesus executed. The first charge was false. The second allegation, claiming to be God, could only have three main responses. Either one, Jesus was lying, or two, Jesus was mentally unstable. He was suffering from a narcissistic, psychopathic, or delusional condition. Or three, he was telling the truth, and he was who he claimed to be. Luke 23, verse 3, goes on to tell us that Pilate asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered, and said, answered him and said, It is as you say. So Pilate said to the chief priest in the crowd, I find no fault in this man. And we as believers, we hold to the view that Jesus was telling the truth and was God and humanity, fully God, fully human. So why did he subject himself to a humiliating death if he is God? Jesus responded to Pilate's question, it is as you say. He was indicating that he was the Messiah, the God the Son. And Pilate, at this point in the trial, wanted to have Jesus beaten and released, but he feared losing his position as governor. Pilate was at a crossroad. He was, at, he was this man standing. Who was this man standing before him? His decision was, was to make no definitive decision at all. Let the process continue. I'll wash my hands of the whole process. Let them execute him. As long as it doesn't interfere with my position as governor, I'll appease the Pharisees and the scribes. Let this humiliating execution continue. Matthew 27, 24 records it this way. When Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude. 
saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just, just person. You see to it. And the principle is this. Some today, like Pilate, choose not to make a decision about Jesus. Uh, it's too controversial. Whatever the culture says, I'll go along with that point of view. And we as believers, we believe that Jesus was telling the truth and was God in humanity, fully God, fully human. Uh, so why did Jesus subject himself to a humiliating death? Uh, well, the process went on uh, and continued on. Jesus, God the Son, the creator of heaven, and earth allowed a, cr a crown of thorns to pierce his head. He was spat upon. He was struck by Ro Roman soldiers. He was brutally beaten uh, by a whip with metal particles attached to the thrones. This scourging would rip the flesh from his back. He was betrayed by the disciple Judas with a kiss. He was denied by his disciple Peter. He was deserted by the 11 disciples at the arrests in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was falsely accused, and he was humiliated by mockery and ridicules from those witnessing his execution, from those passing by, from the chief priests, from the Roman soldiers, and then the two criminals who were being executed join in the mocking. So this day marked the culmination of his three-year ministry upon earth. He could have chosen to die a more noble death, but he allowed those around him to humiliate him even in his death by crucifixion, literally hanging on a cross until he suffocated to death. Philippians 2, chapter 2, verse 8, records it this way. In being found in appearance as a man, he humbles himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And so this day marked the crossroad for human history. We measure time according to the day before and after the death of Christ. Time before his death is BC, before Christ. Time after his death is AD, in the year of our Lord. And most of the people in the crowd chose the road of disbelief. They could not accept that Jesus was God. The passerbys, the chief priests, the Roman soldiers, Pilate, King Herod. But there was one who took the high road, the road less traveled, the road of belief. One of the criminals believed that Jesus was God. Luke 23, verse 39, starts this way. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, you are the Christ. If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has nothing, has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. The two criminals, one on the left, one on the right, and Jesus in the middle. The criminals represent two types of people at a crossroad. Why did Jesus allow himself to be subjugated to this humiliation? Well, first of all, to fulfill prophecy. The scriptures indicated that he would die this way centuries before it happened. Secondly, it was the plan of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit to redeem mankind from hell this way. John 3, 17 reads like this. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Thirdly, it was the way of redemption for the dying thief that day. Jesus was able to identify with one dying criminal who was getting what he deserved. We all deserve to die on the cross and go to hell. By suffering a humil humiliating death, Jesus was able to present the hope of redemption to this dying thief. And also, on a more theological level, it, this, his humiliation displays the attributes of God himself. God, by his nature, he's merciful, 
He's gracious. He's full of goodness. And even though he's sovereign and he's holy, God is humble. He's, he's not proud. Somehow, by God's grace, the dying thief was able to look beyond the present suffering of Jesus Christ and see Jesus for who he was, as God, King of Kings, who really did have a kingdom. And so the dying thief's request, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise or heaven. The promise that Jesus made to the thief on the cross was redemptive. The criminal had nothing to contribute to his salvation, only a heart and a mind that believed that Jesus was God with a coming kingdom. The promise given that day was guaranteed because God never breaks a promise. That day, the criminal died physically but gained everlasting life in the spiritual realm. Based on the authority of God's word uh, spoken to him that day, he entered paradise. He never got baptized. He never went to church. He never taught a Bible lesson or gave anything to, a, to the poor. He had no good work to contribute to his salvation except to believe in Jesus. Jesus. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 reads like this. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. There's a well-known hymn entitled, There is a Fountain. The first stanza goes like this. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains lose all their guilty stains. The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. And there may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. Wash all my sins away. Just as that dying thief request was, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Today, for those who may be listening, who are, at, who are at a crossroads and never made a decision about Jesus Christ. Today, can be, that can be your prayer today. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Save me from my sins and, and allow me to come into your kingdom. If you make this prayer and ask God for, for, for forgiveness, if you make this your heart's prayer, he said he would save you. And it's based on his word. Father, just thank you, Lord, for this moment, just praying. I'm just grateful for the um, opportunity to um, just been called out of darkness into the, the glorious light. Just thanking you for changing my mind, my heart, my soul, and um, thank you for every single person who you've done the same for. Um, be glorified. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, so have the... Um, Great opportunity to bring to you the third word tonight um, is John chapter 19, verses 26 to 27. And um, Jesus said, um, matter of fact, I'm going to start with verse 25. It says, uh, now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother, and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. As, um, as Jesus echoed these words, we know, from the context of scripture, he was on the cross, um, hands bloody, hanging. Um, I can only imagine what thoughts were just going to his mind. I'm just sure he was just probably just hoping that the end was what was near. Um, but as he was hanging on the cross, before his last, he said his last words, he 
looked over, he saw a group of people, but he said to Mary and he said to John these words. Um, the Lord had met God knows countless amounts of people um, during his time on earth. Um, but uh, something just about family and not just family, but John and Mary, they were his, they were his followers as well. They, they truly believed in him. Um, we go to Luke chapter one. Um, we can see Jesus' relationship with Mary and John on display when the angel Gabriel, he visited Mary um, and he proclaimed to her, uh, he said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and overshadow you and that you would give birth to a son who be called Jesus, who be great and called the son of the most high. Also in that same conversation, the Lord spoke to her about um, his, her relative, Elizabeth, as well, who was, I mean, at the time, Elizabeth was, she was old. Uh, she was out of her child-rearing age, and um, he spoke to her and said that she would conceive a son as well. This son, John, John would go on to later testify. We look in John chapter 1, verse 29. He would testify that Jesus was the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. So John not only was his just a follower, John proclaimed that message. He proclaimed it verbally. I know that we live in a time frame. We know that, you know, we're all, a lot of believers are around, but John openly proclaimed that amongst people to actually hear. And that's um, just exciting when you think about so where we are in the world, so many issues going on. It's, I mean, just countless. But John, it, it didn't, didn't matter. John said, just Jesus, right there. He takes away the sin of the world. He is the truth. Um, think about Mary. Mary was his mom. She loved him. She held him in her arms. Um, as a young baby, um, I think about all the, you know, we have five wonderful children and we've been able to rear them. Um, but this experience for her was, it was just, it was, it was different, much different. Um, I was looking at, matter of fact, one of my uh, notes in Bible the other day, and it said that Mary was the only person who was there at the beginning of his life. He was a baby but also the only person that was there at the end of his life as a savior. So just imagine that. Your son, who was a gift not only to the world, but he was still her son. He was her son and from a baby she held him. Then she seen him at the cross at the end of his life and I just can't imagine to see a child die. I, I hope and pray that we never have to experience that pain. But not only that pain to see a child die, he was beyond special. He was the most important figure to ever live. Not only did he live, the extra pain that she saw was people who not only they, they, they hurt him, they tortured him but they rejected him as well. This Jesus who was the truth, he was the life, he was the way, but he was rejected. So I'm sure it was some type of just bewilderment on her mind just to be like, I know <laughs> one day this angel came upon me at the beginning of his life, but then he's on the cross literally dying and to experience that I, I i don't know it's just hard to really put that in, into um into words just to experience what she was um what she was thinking 
Um, but that just came just over and over and over in my mind, just trying to picture her thoughts, just different emotions, not just as, as a mother, but as a follower, a true follower of him, and to know who he was and what he came to do. It is unbelievable. Um, but, um, man, just thinking about Mary's words, and uh, I want to go to Luke chapter two just to just to see her words. Just thinking about how John proclaimed who he who the Lord Jesus was, but Mary proclaimed him as well, and she sang publicly um, in what we call the Magnificat. Matter of fact, I'm sorry, it's Luke chapter one, um, verse 46. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord. Man, well, Sister Sheila, I can hear you saying this right now. I can hear Sister Sheila in a dramatic voice. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior, for he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. But behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed, for he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. As he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. Um, just amazing the, um, the relationship, I'm sure, that they had throughout the years. But for the Lord to tell John, basically, look after my mom and vice versa, um, just I just can't even just imagine all the um the things that she went through and um and still praising the Lord. Um just astonishing. Um and in contrast, just thinking about John, um, I love the way John um starts in matter of fact it's in I believe it's in Mark's gospel, Mark chapter one. Um John starts off, man. It starts off with a, what I call with a bang. He says, um, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John appeared. He came baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a, baptize, a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. It's Mark chapter one, verse one through four. Um, so read these words just briefly, and um, that's what the gospel is all about right there. Ain't nothing more important than repenting from your sins. No matter who you are, no matter what you've been through, the Lord is, he, he's perfect. And is, 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 is Jesus Christ, he is the only way. He is the absolutely only way to get to God. And he is God, but he is, at this point, we look in the script, he is the mediator. It's a massive gap, a massive gap between you, the Lord, and it's a massive big boulder right here. And it's our sin and the Lord is absolutely perfect. He's absolutely not one sin, not one thought. He's, 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 he's perfect. He's holy. And that's something that I know humans, we, we can say those words, we can utter those words, but the perfection, the, the, the holiness and the righteousness that, that, that Christ exudes Repent from your sins, whoever you are today. Repent from your sins. You must cast them down. The Lord, he only, he wants humility. We need his help. We need his help. He's the only way to get back to the Father. 
um, sorry. Um, back to um, this John. When John entered, um, he came pro proclaiming again who Jesus was and what he came to do. Um, John had the it's a great opportunity to to um, to be a witness of Jesus. And I love Matthew. I love Mark. I love um, Luke as um, as gospels. They um, they're special, and I've been reading more and more of them, but. Um, and it's nothing like John. It's a gospel. Um, it's nothing like him. He he he, he records things from a a, a a a close perspective, and I think that's because he was um, he was one of Jesus' three closest disciples, along with Peter and along with James. But John was there, man. If you look at verses like John, um, I mean, just fifteen and sixteen and seventeen. I mean, when when he started talking about the Holy Spirit. Man, he really gets into it, and it's just like uh, I mean, it's 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 it's, it's like HD. And you just reading reading John, it's like it's just like the the gospel in in 4K and OLED, if you know what that means. He is just I mean, it's just like on fire when I read these words. I mean, John just be pages. I'm just like, oh man, how in the world? It's between that that. John, and then of course Paul, throughout all throughout his letters, man. But but actually recording who Jesus was and what he came to do, John got it. He he hit it. He hit it right on the head. And I think that's exactly why. I mean, the Lord just he 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 was special to him because of I mean of all the the the, the, the twelve disciples, he was the only one there at the end. Jesus on the cross. He sorry. He saw Mary Magdalene. It was a few, as I'm sure, there's a bunch of other people there. But I mean, he says something to John. He says something to his mom, and I think that's just crucial. And when looking at these verses, um, a lot. I just want to just really say that they were true followers to to who Jesus was and what he came to do. They um, they were authentic believers. They were loyal to him. They truly loved him. They worshiped him publicly. They testified to his lordship. Um, and that's not because of who they were. That's because of who Christ was. And that's because of the impact that he had on their lives. And, and that's the, the point I definitely want to make. Um, wasn't nothing so special about them. All, all the, special, the specialness is, is, is all about Jesus. He is the one that 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 changes people. Um, um, lastly, just want to say, as far as um, with uh, the Lord, He found time in those those brief moments. Um, his on the cross at the end, He found time to fulfill His duty as Mary's son, um, in an extraordinary act of obedience. Um, thinking about the 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 fifth. Was it the fifth commandment when it said, um, as far as just honoring your father and your mother? Um, Jesus did that. He did that from the beginning of his life. He did it until the end. Um, and our, our, our good shepherd, he, um, he like cemented his bond with his followers right here so that the church could go on. It actually could be able to start, but it could go on. And then we are the 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 benefactors of that right now um, to be able to enjoy him in, um, in our homes with the coronavirus going on all around the world, but we are blessing his name. Even I know y'all blessing his name, even though I can't hear no voices. I know y'all blessing him. Y'all blessing him right along with me because of, yeah, yeah. Come on, Pastor Michael. We blessing his name because of who he is and what he came to do. And, um, we um, just joy in that man, and I again I can't wait to prayerfully and in, in good time be in the presence of everybody here um, and just just enjoy every moment because we we have no idea when when our time is up. We have absolutely no idea, um, and um, just want to encourage the saints to um, continue to walk worthy. Um, 
be encouraged, continue to reach out to, um, to, to each other in prayer, just communicate any, any way you can, and um, just be encouraged because of, uh, of these words and many others. I'm just thankful for the opportunity and um, just pray that we continue to lift up his name. And um, so God bless you guys. Love you all. Good afternoon once again, everyone. God bless you. And thank uh, God for the gentleman who preceded me, and particularly uh, Micah. Uh, he mentioned, he talked about this gap that exists between us and God, and this, this big boulder, I think he called it, of sin that has separated us. Uh, I, I want to talk about that gap just briefly. And I, I think, in fact, I'm quite sure the, the passage that I'm I'm referring to here is in Matthew chapter 27, and it does talk about this, this gap, but I want you to see it in the context of, of what Matthew was writing about here, Matthew 27. I'm going to read the verse, a couple of verses. It says, now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land, and about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out, with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sama bhakteni. That is, in English, <laughs> it means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood there when they heard that said, this man is calling for Elijah. And immediately one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to save him. Wow. What an, an incredible uh, moment in human history here as, as we sit some 2,000 years removed. And again, the picture of this gap is just so stunning in, when you see it from the biblical uh, text. In, in modern, in modern, you know, modern time, that gap I want to talk about really is, is what we're calling social distancing. That we are socially distancing ourselves from one another. That's why I'm here. And that's why you're there. <laughs> and, and supposedly they tell us this is what's best for us that we be separated by miles, by walls, by distance, so that we're not spreading this, this uh, corona COVID-19 virus, so we distance ourselves. Well, when I read this passage, I, I see social distancing is not a new phenomenon. It didn't just start with the coronavirus, but I would suggest to you that the Social distancing, the issue of social distancing is a divine response to you and I, sin. He has distanced himself from humanity because, as Micah said, this big boulder that exists, that separates us. So social distancing, when we're looking at this passage, I want to look at it from maybe three, four, maybe five, I don't know what the time will allow, but um, one, I want to look at it from a theological perspective, the idea of social distancing. In the text, the, the Bible says, from the sixth hour to the ninth hour. Now, according to Jewish reckoning of time, that's from 12 to three o'clock. 12 in the afternoon to three o'clock in the afternoon. So from 12 in the afternoon to 3 o'clock in the afternoon, darkness covered the land, which means this, that the darkness was not a usual darkness. It was an unusual darkness. And this darkness was not the result of the sun, the sun's, S-U-N, the sun's relationship to the earth, usually when darkness hits the earth, is because the earth has turned away. A portion, a hemisphere of the earth has turned away.
from the sunlight. Well, that's not what's happening here in Matthew 27. What's happening here is not the sun, S-U-N, or the earth turning away from the sun. So it's not the sun's relationship to the earth, but rather it is, was because of the sun's relationship to the father. That is the S-O-N. The son's relationship to the father was the cause of the darkness. That is, darkness became pervasive. Darkness in scripture often represents evil. Evil was there at the cross. Darkness represents disgrace. Disgrace was there at the, at the cross. Obscurity. That darkness comes in and obscures the ability to see. It's, it was there at the cross. Failure, sin, blindness, all of these, these um, aspects were there at the cross. Hence, the son's relationship to the father. It affected their relationship. And so darkness came between, as it were the Father and the Son. Darkness set over the land because there was darkness that was entering into the relationship between the Father and the Son. Theologically, we have to ask, and, and you know, in a sense, it, it really does go beyond our ability to fully comprehend. And, and so I want to tread lightly over this issue because I don't know the end from the beginning. But I do know aspects of it that from the biblical perspective, theologically, something happened on that cross that caused the son to say to the father, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Theologically, if you, if you were to look at Exodus chapter 12, verse 6, it says this, and I'm reading it. And in fact, I'm reading it from the Holman Christian Standard Version. The Holman and Christian Standard Version says, Now you shall keep the Lamb until the 14th day of the same month. And then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. In the King James Version, Old King James, the Old King James says the, old, the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill the lamb between the evenings. What an interesting way to phrase it. The Holman says, at twilight. Well, between the evenings really is the targeted time that the lamb was to be slain, according to Exodus, as they're getting ready to be set free by, by the death angel. God told Moses, sprinkle blood the doorpost, because when that death angel comes through, he's going to kill the firstborn. Well, the lamb, the lamb that was to be slain as part of this celebratory uh, reminder of God's saving them from bondage in Israel, this, this wonderful celebration of the atonement was to be done in the month of Abi, on the 14th day of the month, and at 3 o'clock, that lamb was to be slain. Scripture says that from the 6th to the ninth hour, darkness was over the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In this moment, in this instance, that is the moment, that three o'clock hour where Jesus was bearing the full brunt of the Father's wrath. It's an incredible concept, an incredible concept that God the Son, that God the Son could endure the wrath of the Father. Jesus, in the Gospel of Matthew, 
often quoted scripture and he was so intent on fulfilling the Old Testament portrayal of, of his life. And so he quotes from um, Psalm 22 verse 1 where King David writes uh, in, in somewhat of a, a pre-Messiah moment, experiencing suffering upon his own, and he cries out to God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But Jesus is fulfilling the sacrificial requirement for Israel in that he becomes the lamb. And so theologically, what we see as Christ is hanging on that cross is that it points to the reality of God's holy perfections fulfilled in punishing his son. God is holy in a way that you and I can't even begin to imagine. His offense towards sin is beyond our imagination. We can't even begin to really grasp how offended God was. And yet he gives us a picture what we can't imagine with our mind, we can see with our mind's eye. When Christ hung on that cross, that's the picture that we're to grasp concerning the Father's wrath and his absolute repudiation of anything that's not like him. Sin, he rejects. The reality of personal sin and spiritual corruption, we're to see that at this moment as, as the father punishes the son and sin is an offense to God. And when he's offended and he requires a capital, it's a capital crime. Somebody's got to die for this. Requires death and you and I are the criminals. And he has no ability. God has no ability like our modern judges. He has no ability. He cannot tolerate Sin, absolutely not. Has no tolerance for it at all. Will not excuse it. It has to be dealt with. According to Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 13, the Bible says, your eyes, according to the Holman Christian standard, your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. I, I don't know what that's like. Chances are, I don't think you and I know what it's like either. What it means to not tolerate wrongdoing. Because there is that which is in us, a tolerance for evil. That's our problem. And, and that's why the father distanced himself. Not for fear that somehow or another we would affect him and cause him to catch the virus of sin? <laughs> no way, no. He distanced himself from us to protect us. Wow. What an amazing reality. The spiritual aspect of social distancing leads to spiritual death. So the cries of Christ from the cross to the Father, he didn't call him Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? He called him judicially the official office of the Godhead and not the familial. That, that is the father relationship wasn't, wasn't what he was experiencing in this moment. What he was experiencing in this moment was the judicial office of God. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, Paul writes, he says, we implore you, we beg you, we beseech you, be reconciled to God. It sounds like he is so, it's such an imperative. You've got to do this. And then he adds, Paul adds, for God made him, that is Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Yes, he distanced himself from us so that indeed he might save us. And this is how he does it. He poured out on his son his wrath. 
And what we hear from the cross is not, not only a theological uh, social distancing or spiritual social distancing, but an emotional social distancing. Jesus, in fact, in the garden, in the garden, Jesus, Jesus said, and I think it's in Mark chapter 14, where he cries out, my soul, I want you to pray with me, guys. My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. He was beginning to feel death in those moments, the anticipation of what awaited him. Sorrow had so overcome him because of what? was awaiting him at the cross. And so he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And, and I, I just ponder this question, and I don't know if, I, I, if there is an answer, but he knew clearly, he knew, Jesus knew what was awaiting him. He said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, and yet he said, why? Why have you forsaken me? Did he not know? Did it surprise him? I don't know. I suspect perhaps he's attempting to reveal in this moment the utter, the utter wrenching of his soul in absolute horror as he's inching closer to the moment where he would experience the pure, undiluted and complete total wrath of the Father. Maybe, maybe he's indicating just how utterly horrific it is to be distanced from the Father spiritually. From the cross, he was experiencing untold emotional anguish, depths of grief and spiritual agony that you and I have no clue what that's like. It's unimaginable mental distress and unrelenting torment down deep in the depths of his very being. He felt that all because of social distancing. He was in horror as the father punished him for sin. And the father in that moment is utterly, utterly rejecting the son. And the son knows it. It would be foolish and arrogant of any one of us, or maybe even ignorant, for us to think or even to say that we understand this. We understand the depths of his suffering. I, I do not. I can't even begin to fathom. And, and that's why he went there, to keep me from having to know what it's like to be abandoned by the Father. The Father poured out on Christ his wrath as a statement of his rejection of sin. This was the father's outrage against sin. And one day, unfortunately, sinners, lost people who had no propylenic, no protection, no advocate, they will experience the utter horror of the wrath of God. Socially, God rejected his son so that he could accept us. <laughs> what an amazing reality. He used his son as, as, this, as this wall to protect us from his own wrath. Social distancing is not new. In fact, um, one of the other terms that comes up during this, this time of, of the uh, coronavirus is this issue of herd immunity, that uh, some places, maybe in California and other places, they have developed a herd immunity in that the virus somehow or another got here early and somehow or another, they didn't know what it was, but they developed a, a social immunity to the virus. And hence, you don't see the flaring up of, of uh, cases and death, as much death in California as you do in New York. They call it herd immunity. And, and in, in the herd immunity, and, you know, the reflection of it is you and I have a sense of herd immunity and that sin sometimes, I think, too often, all too often, we, we feel that there's an immunity to it. We don't get it. We don't, we don't get it. The vileness of it. The depth of the, the, uh, the heart and soul, the mind, that can, can be so, so dead set against God. We don't get it. 
that's why he went to the cross to save us. I, I love what uh, J.I. Packard wrote in his book, Knowing God. Uh, he writes this, and I quote, God's wrath in the Bible is never capricious. He doesn't, he doesn't pour out his wrath in a flippant way. He's never self-indulgent with his wrath. He, is never, he never responds with wrath from irritability. He's not irritable. I know it's like I was on a call the other day and a number of pastors, we were talking through an issue and one of our pastors was irritable. He hung up in utter anguish and, and anger. He responded in anger. I know what that's like as well, but that's not how God handles his wrath. If he did, we would have been gone a long time ago. He's not irritable, but but uh, J.I. Packer says he's 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 morally ignoble, meaning this that instead of reactive, he is objectively responding to moral evil. He he is holy, and this is what he must do. And so, when Christ died on the cross, the Father socially distance himself from him so that you and I might might uh, know the peace of God just the safe haven of being close to God and you know what I, I like Micah I love what Micah said I you know this ain't my thing this thing of social distancing it's just not it doesn't feel good at all God didn't make us for this he made us for relationships. He made us for him. And oh, oh, there are moments when I, I just yearn to be close to him. And yet, to my shame, there are moments when it doesn't matter and I'm indifferent. God forgive me. Jesus was so obsessed, overwhelmed, by the moment of the father's absence, the pouring out a wrath on him, he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Father, thank you for uh, these considerations. Bless to our heart, we pray these truths, and we give you glory even now in Jesus' name. God bless you, beloved. Um, good evening to everyone. As Pastor said, it is a little odd to be doing this, <laughs> but um, I am grateful for the blood. Um, because of the blood, I truly have victory. Oh, the blood of Jesus. 
washes me all the blood of Jesus shed for me what a sacrifice that saved my life yes the blood it is my victory What a sacrifice that saved my life. Yes, the blood, it is my victory. Oh, what love. No greater love, grace, how can it be that in my sin, yes, even then, he shed his blood for me. Jesus washes me, oh, the blood of Jesus shed for me, what a sacrifice that saved my life, oh, the blood, it is my victory. What a sacrifice that saved my life. Yes, the blood, it is my victory. My victory. Bless the Lord. It's a Lord. It is good to be here this evening. This is a wonderful service. And although we may be apart physically, the spirit is definitely amongst us. Amen. I feel connected to everyone spiritually without a doubt. Um, so it's just good to see this beautiful day outside, although it's windy here. Uh, but it is just wonderful anytime we have a chance to gather as saints. Amen. So I'm going to go right into my word. Um, I'm going to go from John 19. And I'll be reading John 19, verse 28. And I'll give you a second to go there. John 19, 28. And it reads... After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. The words that Jesus spoke here is the shortest translated phrase of all the words that he spoke from the cross. In the midst of his anguish, in the middle of his pain, Jesus took this moment to speak just two words to convert, convey how he felt. However, it's important that we look at what the rest of that verse says. And it says that Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, but what things had been accomplished? We only need look at Psalm 69 to see some of the many prophecies that in this one psalm alone had already been fulfilled. If you can quickly turn to 60, uh, Psalm 69, I'm just going to run through it very quickly. But the things that had been fulfilled, number one, he had sunk into a deep mire, as it mentioned in verse two. He had been hated without a cause, which mentioned in verse four. 
He had borne reproach and shame, as mentioned in verse 7. He had become a stranger unto his brethren, as mentioned in verse 8. He had become a proverb to his rivalers and the song of the drunkards, verses 11 and 12. He had cried unto God in his distress, verses 17 through 20. And now there remained nothing more than him being offered vinegar and gall, as mentioned in verse 21. Psalm 69, 21 reads, they gave me gall for my food and for my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. And in order to fulfill this verse, he cried, I thirst. Now, at the same time that he was fulfilling the prophecies in Psalm 69, he fulfilled all the prophecies in Psalm 22 as well as Isaiah 53, and really parts of many other psalms he had fulfilled at this point. In this moment when Jesus said those words, I thirst, he could have been saying, look, what I am doing now was written centuries ago. It is part of God's plan that was set in place long before now. But why did Jesus say, I thirst? There are multiple possible reasons why Jesus would utter these words. We have already said that him saying those words fulfill prophecy. But another reason John may have included these words in his account of the crucifixion is to point to Jesus' humanity. Very often when a person is dying, a nurse or a loved one will bring a cup of ice chips and a spoon to place a chip or two on the person's tongue. Sometimes a little sponge on a stick is used. The sponge is soaked in water and the dying person can suck on the sponge. This is not unlike what happened at the cross as a sponge was dipped in wine vinegar and affixed to a stick and lifted up to Jesus. Jesus being human, thirsted as a person does when dying. It was even more so for Jesus because he had been whipped to the point of having open wounds and nailed to a cross. And these things caused him to lose much of his blood. This would lead to a condition known as hypovolemia, of which one of the symptoms of losing that much blood is extreme thirst. In the midst of his suffering, his human body cried out for replenishment. His body, as with any human, would have led him to be thirsty. But there's another way of understanding these words. And that is the words of a savior speaking of his readiness to fulfill the mission for which his father had sent him. In Matthew 20, verse 22, when James and John asked Jesus if they could sit at his right and left hand when he came into his kingdom, Jesus replied, are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink. Likewise, in John 18, verse 11, as Jesus was being arrested, Peter drew his sword, but Jesus told him, put your sword back in his sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that my father has given me? In each of these instances, Jesus used the metaphor of drinking as a way of describing the suffering he would endure on the cross. Jesus' words, I thirst, could have pointed not only to his willingness to drink the cup of suffering and sin and hate, but to drink it down completely. Maybe because he was nearing the end, perhaps he was pointing to the fact that the cup was now nearly empty. He was ready to completely 
be emptied for the sake of man. We can go back and reread John 19, 28, where it says, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Jesus could have meant, bring it on. I am ready to finish the cup that I must drink in order to save mankind. You could say he was thirsty to complete his mission. There is still another way of understanding John's inclusion of these words. And this way is filled with irony. In John 4, Jesus meets a Samaritan woman at Jacob's well. She's been married and divorced five times and was living with a man who was not her husband. She was likely an outcast among her people. Jesus asked her to draw water from the well for him. And then he says, if you knew who you were talking to, you would ask of me and I would give you living water and you would never thirst again. In addition, in John 7, Jesus said to the multitudes in Jerusalem, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and let the one who believes in me drink. It is precisely these two passages, John 4 and John 7, that point to the irony of Jesus' words from the cross. He who was the source of living water is now thirsty as he dies on the cross. The source of life, of grace, of hope, of love, of living water is drying up. The spring is nearly extinguished. He has poured out his living water for man to point where he himself, the one who has made it possible for those who believe in him to thirst no more, is now thirsty. But thirsty for what? I believe we can find our answer at the beginning of Psalm 42, where it says, as the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O oh God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before you? My tears have been my food day and night, while they continually say to me, where is your God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul within me. Or we could read the words of Psalm 143, where it reads, for the enemy has persecuted my soul. He has crushed my life to the ground. He has made me dwell in darkness like those who have long been dead. Therefore, my spirit is overwhelmed within me. My heart within me is distressed. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all your works. I muse on the work of your hands. I spread out my hands to you. My soul longs for you like a thirsty land. The words I thirst could have been spoken by Jesus at that time, where in the middle of taking on the sins of man, he felt far away from the Father and thirsted for a return to the communion that from the beginning of time he had shared with him especially since these words immediately follow Jesus uttering, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? Jesus agonizingly yearned to return to the Father. But first, he had to complete the mission for which he had been sent to earth. And that was to make a way for man's relationship with the Father to be restored. And for us to thirst to be in communion with him. So I ask you as I conclude, where is your thirst? Even in the midst of all of the fear and anxiety that we are experiencing and our daily stress, 
Do you thirst to be in communion with the Father? Many of us have been given so much time at home to sit still for a while. But are we sitting still and yearning to be in communion and relationship with the Father in this time? Do you thirst to be fully quenched by the knowledge and love of Jesus Christ? Do you thirst to be immersed in all that he wants to offer us in our lives? With what we are enduring today, we should realize we need him now more than ever. I pray that we get to a place in our lives where we wake up every morning experiencing just a small portion of the thirst that Christ had on the cross to want to be near the Father and desire to want to draw closer to him. In Revelation 21, 6, it reads, And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. It is comforting to know even with all that we are enduring, that at the end of it all, he who said, I thirst on the cross will make sure that we who believe in him will thirst no more. And Heavenly Father, we just say thank you for this time together once again. We ask you, Lord, to refresh us, Heavenly Father. Fire need is mainly and really only for you. Let us develop the desire to be thirsty, to know you better. We thank you for this evening. We thank you for all that you did on the cross. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Just first of all, just thank the Lord for uh, the messages for the brothers speaking. Uh, they've been awesome. And um, just thank thank God for the for the word, and um, the uh, word that I have for this evening is John chapter nineteen, verse thirty. Um, it reads the sixth word. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, "It is finished," and he bowed his head and gave up the spirit. And the, the first thing that came to my mind is what was finished. And so I uh, took a look at the word. Uh, we often hear the word uh, teleo or to tell us die for the word finished. And um, it, it, it has to do with the, with the scriptures. Uh, specifically as uh, revealed in scripture and that was in that i found interesting because as i re reviewed this uh in john 9 uh, john 1930 uh well it says that uh it is finished in in mark 1537 jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost so uh, what it, it's uh, the given the loud voice was a shout of victory. It was a shout of triumph. It is finished. And it was a declaration that all that the Lord Jesus came from heaven to earth to do was completed, was done, mission accomplished. And um, it, it, it also in thinking about this word, it showed me the importance of the scriptures themselves. Um, the messianic promises or prophecies uh, were finished. Pastor De uh, Kevin just went through a number of the prophecies uh, that uh, he talked about that were completed. And um, in John 17, 4, the Lord Jesus says, I have glorified thee on the earth, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Uh, and in, even in the verse that uh, 
Kevin just did. He said, John 19, 28. He says, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scriptures might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. And so uh, what we see here is that Jesus was, one of the things he was doing was obviously fulfilling uh, the prophecies that were written. And I find that important because oftentimes I talk to people uh, either on the street or even at church uh, uh, when we have the uh, outreach. And they talk about the fact that uh, the white man wrote the, wrote the scriptures. Um, and if you look at what Jesus is saying, he's pointing to these very scriptures that, are con that will either justify you or condemn you. And so um, when I look at, for instance, Luke chapter 24, uh, verses 25 through 27, he says, Jesus then said to them, you foolish people, you find it so hard to believe that all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures, wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets and explained from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And, you know, and some of the things that he, I, I, I'm sure, no doubt, that uh, if, if he didn't explain it, they're, they're there. Um, Genesis 3.15, the promise of the Redeemer. Uh, Genesis 22, chapter 22, where Abraham offered to sacrifice his son Isaac. But what we see here is the Lord God sacrificing his son, Jesus. Uh, Exodus chapter 12, uh, 11, I believe Pastor talked about this. Um, the, the lamb uh, that was offered, he had to be examined for four days. Christ was examined for three years in public ministry. The, the lamb had to have no blemish. The Lord Jesus had no sin. Uh, the blood from the lamb saved Israel when they put it on the doorpost and the lintel. But the blood of Christ saves his own, those who love him, from the judgment. So there are so many parallels and types that the, they're all found in the scriptures, which is what he came to fulfill. So we see that, uh, of course, he, he, he said it was finished. There were some things that were not finished. But, for instance, the dismissal of the Spirit, that was about to happen uh, into the hands of the Father. Uh, the piercing, matter of fact, Michael may be speaking about that next, I believe. Uh, the piercing with the spear. Uh, to preserving of his unbroken bones, Psalm 34, 20. Piercing of the spirit, Zechariah Zach, uh, 20, 12, and 10. Um, the, uh, into his hands I could mend my spirit, uh, Psalm 31, 5. Uh, the bearer in the rich man's tomb, Isaiah 53, 9. And, of course, death itself. So there were some things that were not finished, but... Jesus, knowing all things, they were, they were finished. They were finished. Um, no doubt about it. So there are some things that uh, when he says it, it is finished, what was finished? And uh, one of the things is that all that was needed to reveal the full character of God um, had now been accomplished. And when I say that, we, uh, I, I, before this was taking place, I had often thought, and, and I know sin separates from God, but I often thought, why don't we hear from him? Why don't we hear from him more often in the Old Testament? Well, uh, of course, the Hebrews said that God in sundry times and in diverse manners spoke in time past by the prophets. So what do we see here? F from the time of Adam, 
We don't hear from him no more until the time that the Lord Jesus came. And so Isaiah 59 2 says, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God. That big gap that Michael was talking about and that pastor enumerated on, that's a big gap. Your iniquities have separated you between you and your God and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. And so, you know, that answers the question, why we didn't hear from him so, for so long until the Lord Jesus came. So in Luke chapter 10, verse 22, he says, my father has entrusted everything to me. No one truly knows the son except the father. And no one truly knows the father except the son and those to whom the son chooses to reveal him. So what I'm talking about is knowing the full character of God. And this was, was unveiled when the Lord Jesus came. Of course, he had talked to the prophets, but we learned a lot more when Christ came and started talking about the Father. So we see in John chapter 17, again, he says, uh, particularly in verse, verse 6, although we see this in verse 3 and verse 8, he says, I have re revealed or manifested you to the ones you gave me from this world. They were always yours. You gave them to me and they have kept your word. And so what he was doing, he was revealing himself to us. Uh, Second Peter 3.18 tells us what our responsibility is. He says, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. So Christ has now come and revealed himself. It's our responsibility to get to know him. And I, 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 that's why I thank the Lord for the, for, for, for the scriptures that we can dig and learn. We're learning all the time. And um, a, another important point that he pointed out, um, that uh, it is finished. Uh, so what is finished? And that was all the requirements of the law. Um, that all that was required by the law before sinners could be saved had now been performed. And that was important because we all trying to get to heaven by works. And so what do we find about works? James 2.10 says, for whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. We also find in Galatians 2.16, uh, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus, in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So we learn that our good works ain't going to save us. They're useless. So we depend on God's grace. Uh, his gift of his son, believing faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So Galatians 3.13 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. And the Lord Jesus did just that for us. So we find that uh, Jesus fulfilled, um, uh, he revealed his character to us. Uh, he fulfilled the requirements of the law. And he did one other very important thing. Not that there weren't other things that were done, uh, but just to point out three. And that is, he paid the full price for our redemption. Uh, First Peter. 118 says, for as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And Luke 22, verse 3, then enter Satan. And this is why I heard Pastor Ron talking about Satan earlier. Um, he um, 
we see here, then enter Satan into Judas Iscariot. One of the things we find here about the redemption was that the Lord Jesus was suffering <clears throat> at the hand of man. But that included you and me. It also included Satan and it included God because Satan entered into um, Judas. Uh, and in Luke 22, 3, it says, then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the 12. And he went his way and com communed with the chief priest and captains how they might betray him unto them. So he involved others as well. Uh, not only that, but we know that Satan is a deceiver uh, and a liar. And in, 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 in 1 Kings 22, 22, it shows how even in the presence of God, uh, lying spirits will come and deceive people. So, um, so we, 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 we have to be careful about that. But, but we see also that God had a hand, and we know the love of God. But yet, Isaiah 53.10 says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, and he shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. So as I uh, close, I just want to, uh, well, not particularly close. Hold on. Let me just hold that back just a minute. Um, one of the things that we, we, we see here is, is God's great purpose um, for sending his son. And one of those purposes was to display God's grace, to display God's grace. And I, in reading and studying, it helped me to, to, to get a better understanding of how that was. Um, and to magnify his son in the creating in creating children in his own image and glory. So God is creating, he's creating those who love him um, into the image of his son uh, by his grace. And so that means God gets glory <clears throat> um, for, for his grace. And uh, because we're going to give him glory. Look at what he brought us from. Uh, because we were without hope and uh, uh, had no hope in the world. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1. And I'm using the New Living Translation here. But it says, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. That is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to, the, to his dear son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. And uh, another scripture, uh, New Living Translation, 1 Corinthians chapter 26 to 29, tells us what kind of people we were. Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in the world's eyes are powerful, are wealthy. Remember, dear brothers, he says, when, when God, few of you were, um, were powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God chose things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. And he chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. As a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. 
And so we find that it's not by works of righteousness that we've done uh, that he's saved us, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renew renewing of the Holy Spirit, according to Titus 3 and 5. Of course, uh, Paul explained also in, in Ephesians 2, 7 and 8, uh, that in the ages to come, he might show exceeding the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, uh, not of works, lest any man should boast. So God gets the glory for saving our souls. And... Um, and then one other thing, and this is where Ephesians uh, 2, 12, uh, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So we see, and this is again, when I think um, of what, uh, about the scriptures, the importance of the scriptures, and the importance of believing the scriptures, because in the Lord Jesus had people who didn't believe him too. And in John chapter five verse forty six, he said, "For ye, for had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if you believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words?" And in uh, John chapter 8, verse 24, uh, believing that the white man wrote the word, he says, I said, therefore, unto you that ye shall die in your sins. If ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. So it's, it, it, the word is absolutely important, absolutely important. And I, my prayer is that people will learn to... Um, uh, you know, our loved ones and, 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 and people we run into will accept the, uh, the Lord Jesus before it's too late. Um, and in closing, uh, he said, John 3, 15, 3, 18, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he have not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And 336, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So it is finished. God has finished. It's our part to believe. And uh, I thank the Lord for his grace and his mercy. Praise the Lord. God bless everyone. It is uh, really uh, good to be with you this evening, celebrating uh, our Good Friday and remembering uh, Christ's work uh, on the cross. And, you know, it's amazing that uh, we're able to connect this way. Just thanking God for the authenticity uh, of believers who seek to be in fellowship, even though we are uh, separated by, um, by space. So I'll be... Um, bringing a word on um, Christ's last word, which is found in Luke chapter 23, verse 46. And I'd like to read 44 through 46. Uh, and it was now about the sixth hour, and darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour. The sun being obscured, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And Jesus, crying out with a loud voice, said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Father, indeed, uh, we are grateful. Thanking you, Lord God, for your son, for your uh, working in our lives, praying that you will bless uh, your word. Thank you for um, the gifts in teachers and preachers that have gone before us this evening. Uh, bless those who remain with us, and for all of this, we give you glory. 
uh, as I've been thinking about the the message and and this word, um, Father, into thy hands I commit myself. I I think about or have thought about uh, family members and or friends that have uh, died recently or died, you know, in our lives. And, um, you know, our mom, uh, daddy, aunt, many recently, and uh, particularly mom, when she uh, passed, um, prior to her passing, she had an accident and fell. And uh, the fall caused uh, brain damage. And she was in the hospital and they had put her on uh, life support. Family decided that we would take her off of life support and allow God's will to be done. And, and so as we were waiting and uh, praying, seeing what God would do, Bob, my brother, and I went up to see her, uh, to sit with her in the hospital. And the, the injury caused, uh, and the brain damage caused her face to distort. So, you know, she didn't look like the ruby, uh, you know, that we knew and grew up with. And yet, while we were sitting there, Bob and I, um, Mama took a breath and her face changed. Um, it, it, her face became the face of Ruby that we knew. And a smile came over her face. And then she breathed her last and, and died. And I think about, um, think about that often. Uh, that she, um, she was probably prepared for death, but didn't know when uh, she would die. Daddy, Aunt Minnie, um, Steve Rideout's brother, um, Pastor Bill's sister, you know, people have died in the last few years, in the last few months, but they didn't know when uh, they would die. But they, many of them were prepared. Um, probably had expectations for how they would be received in heaven. Uh, in fact, looking at mama's face, you could almost see a trusting release in her face as she passed from this life to life in heaven. And yet, no matter the circumstances of one's dying, a family member or friend, uh, neither mom, dad, aunt, many, or anybody else has the opportunity to say, hold up, I'm not finished. I, I have one more thing to do. No, we, we don't have that opportunity. We don't get to say when we die. There's only one person, the God man, uh, Jesus Christ, who had the ability, the control over his life and death to determine when he would die. And, and so what we see in uh, this verse is that Christ had control uh, over his death. Uh, I want to look at a few scriptures with you just to uh, observe the, um, the facts behind his control. Uh, over his death. Uh, first, Paul, the apostle, tells us in Philippians, the second chapter, um, around the sixth through the eighth verse, that Jesus intentionally and voluntarily emptied himself. And while being in the form of God, in fact, being God, took on human form and humbled himself to death, even death on a cross. He was in full control, his decision, when he would die. Secondly, the, the Apostle John 
tells us in his gospel, um, chapter 10, uh, verses 15 through 18, where Jesus said with great authority, no one takes my life. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. Jesus in full control. You know, people think, well, you know, the Jews killed him or the Romans killed him. Not, not, no, no. Jesus gave his life. And then Paul again tells us in Romans, the uh, third chapter, uh, verses 24 through 26, that there was actually a plan. In fact, uh, I'm going to turn there, if you would turn there with me. Romans chapter 3, we'll start reading at verse 24. Actually, let's start at verse 23. Um, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. Paul says, for the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. In our study of Romans, we we understand that uh, people were sinning uh, since the beginning of time. And Paul says here that God passed over uh, those sins in the past previously committed. And the reason he did that is because there was a plan for all of those sins to be um, captured in the shedding of his son's blood on Calvary's cross. And so the plan, even before the foundation of the world, was that every sin, from the sin committed by Adam to the last sin before Christ comes, would be paid for with the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross that every man that has faith, every man, every woman that has faith in Jesus Christ would be redeemed. What a plan. Perfectly planned, perfectly executed, full control and sovereignty in the Lord Jesus Christ. He was in control. Now let's turn our attention to, uh, back to Luke and just take a look at the, some of the words that uh, Christ uttered. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So first, Jesus called God Father. Mm. You know, I think about my dad and <laughs> the, the intimate relationship that we had with him. And many of us think about our fathers So you can imagine that Jesus turning to his father at this time on the cross, loving and trusting relationship, that this was an intimate relationship between Jesus and the father. It was an eternal relationship. Had no beginning, will have no end. A relationship of unity. Jesus often uh, referred to the Father and said, the Father and I are one. And it was a pleasing relationship. Um, John records Jesus saying in the eighth chapter, 31st verse, Jesus said, I always do those things that please the Father. That word always is an absolute Word, it means never failing, never failing. He loved the Father. He said, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Now, we know that um, 
God is a spirit that he doesn't have feet, hands, eyes, and, and a mouth, but, but yet the scriptures record words that symbolize um, the, the idea that God is able, and the word hands here does that. Symbolically, Jesus was saying, I trust the Father. He put his trust in the Father because in the Father, who is all-powerful and almighty, I can trust him. He put his trust in the full and complete authority of God over all of life. You know, Nehemiah used uh, the same word when he was talking to the Jews to tell the Jews, let's go rebuild the wall. And, and he told the Jews, he said, God's hand is upon me and is favorable towards me. And so we, we see that Jesus trusted God, enabling him to put his spirit into his hands. And then he said, I commit my spirit. Well, Jesus uh, is the God man, fully God, fully man. And, and he had a spirit of life, like all humans, the breath of life breathed into man by God, enabling man to communicate with God. Like all humans, when we die, that breath of life, that spirit of life goes out of us and, and returns back to God. However, in Jesus' um, case, he gave it up. No one took it from him. Uh, no one killed him. Uh, no one slayed him. He voluntarily gave up uh, his spirit unto the Lord. And, and as Pastor Bill said, you know, he did it with a loud voice. And, and that voice was a, a voicing of victory. You know, some might think that, you know, Jesus was on the cross whimpering and, and slowly dying. No, no, no. He was accomplishing the plan. He was accomplishing the plan that God had laid out. Jesus knew that he was born to die. He lived knowing his purpose. And when he had accomplished all that had been planned, he victoriously said with a loud voice, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Father, we thank you for giving us your son, uh, for allowing us to, uh, to know him. In fact, um, in an earlier song, I think it was Sister Carolyn said that uh, on the cross, uh, you, you made it possible for us to know you. So we're thankful, God, praying that you will indeed uh, bless our hearts to be refreshed and reminded of the great sacrifice that led to our salvation. So, Pastor... Um, before we close out, I know Melissa Colvin is going to sing, but I have um, a few questions. Michael, if you could post those or bring those up for us. While Michael is doing that, I'll go ahead and, and read one. Um, and if you desire to answer them, you could answer tonight or contemplate them over the next few days. But uh, one of the questions is after hearing these seven messages, uh, you're in an elevator with another person. You have 30 seconds before you get off. The person asks you, does God really have hands? And you say to yourself, where did that question come from? But the, the dilemma is, how would you respond with the gospel to this person and answer their question? So if someone might have an answer, raise your hand and share with us. Uh, 
So I can't share my screen to see hands, Pastor. If you um you can okay. share it on your end if you want. Yeah, I have to open up my file to get it. Okay. Uh no hands, but I'll read the question again. Okay. You're in an elevator with another person. You have about 30 seconds before you get off on your floor. The person asks you, does God really have hands? You say, oh my, where did that come from? How would you respond with the gospel and answer this question? Anybody got an answer? And uh, Sister Blanche actually just wrote in and said, God is spirit, but we are his hands. Okay. Thank you for that, Sister Blanche. All right. Uh, no other hands, Pastor Michael. All righty. So, um, Brother Michael, if we could, um, maybe I'll get Sister Audrey to send out those questions. And if I'm you want to uh, add them to the chat, also. to the chat, that would be great. Yeah. There are three questions there, family. Contemplate those over. Uh, the next few days. And, and uh, let's see, it looks like I just got a message that Sister Sheila Wilson has a comment. I don't see her hand raised, but let me locate her one second. All right. Sister Sheila, you're online. Um, I would simply answer, yes, he does have hands. The reason why I know he has hands is because in John 3, 16, it said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And if you gave me something, I would ask the person, what would you use? And I'm sure their answer would be hands. Mm. And, and I would simply say, well, that's exactly what God did in a very supernatural way, he reached down from eternity into time and he gave Jesus. He first gave him by moving his hands. He, he used holy men of God and, and they were actually in his hands that they could not error. And they wrote the scriptures. And then I would go on. I, I don't want to keep going, but I would constantly <laughs> use. Thank you. Very good. Metaphorically, to let him know yeah. that ultimately he gave Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you paid. Bearing all my sin and shame, and love you came and gave amazing grace. Thank you for this love, Lord. Thank you for the nail pierced hands. Wash me in your cleansing flow. Now all I know, your forgiveness and embrace. What is the land? Seated on the throne, crown you now with many crowns, you reign victorious, high and lifted up, Jesus, Son of God. Darling of heaven, crucified. Worthy is the 
Bless you all. And just wanted to respond quickly to the question, does God have hands? And I would tell that person in the elevator, well, God is a spirit, but Jesus is God, and he definitely had hands. And those hands were nailed to a cross for our redemption. In his humanity, his hands indeed were nailed to the cross that we might live. Amen. God bless you, Sister Tracy. Um, that was a wonderful 30 seconds. Very good. And uh, those questions are for us to think about. And in our days of connecting with family and friends, just think through uh, how we might respond to real life situations like that. Um, you know, another question as we close out is why do we have seven last words every year? You know, the same words, and you know, I know that might be going, that question might be going through um, everyone's head. But as we, we close out, um, I was thinking about that and was just thinking that it's, it's almost like a family reunion, you know, where annually you get together and to remember, uh, to share uh, stories to um, 
And in this case, it's to remember what Jesus did for us in, in reality, that he, uh, that he lived. He came, he lived, um, he was crucified, and that he gave up his life uh, for us. And uh, what a great way to do that by reading through the word, hearing the message from teachers and preachers of the word, and sharing together. And like Micah and, and Pastor, I wish that we had been uh, together in the building, uh, but yeah, even where we are, I, I think it's been a, a wonderful uh, couple of hours to be together and to share in the word of God. And so I just um, pray that you have been refreshed, uh, that God has reminded us uh, of what he has done for us, and that we are encouraged uh, because we, have, we, we serve a living God, and he reigns, and he is sovereign, and uh, he's coming again. And so maybe there's someone on the, um, the Zoom with us in this worship who may not be sure of their salvation. And so we hope that something has been said, uh, maybe in the song or in the, uh, the word that has convicted your heart. And so as we close out in prayer, uh, praying that God would indeed uh, draw you unto him and that you might even today, because today is the day of salvation, that you might ask him to forgive you for your sins and to be your savior. And so, Father, we are grateful again that you have uh, blessed us in this day, that you have blessed us uh, throughout our lives uh, with mercy, uh, that even before the foundation of the world, that you have chosen us to be uh, your children. That, uh, as Paul says, that you have lavished uh, your grace upon us, that you have chosen us uh, in your Son, Jesus Christ. Uh, that you have made yourself known through him, and that you purposely uh, sent him to the cross that he voluntarily gave his life, shed his blood to redeem us, to give us the right to the tree of life, to eternal life, that we might have that and have it for all eternity. God, we bless you. We pray, God, that someone who isn't sure might um, raise their hand. And, and if you desire to know more about Jesus and his salvation, uh, that you would reach out to us. Uh, you can email the church at office at gmail.com. You can call 410-913-7261. Be happy to talk with you. Let us know. We'd be happy to talk with you about our Savior. And so, Father, as we close out, go with us, and as we go, we'll give you glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, why don't you open it up and just say, let everybody say hi in one big... All right, all right, hold on a second. Hold yeah, on open a second. it up. Hold on, hold on. All right. Say hello, everybody. Hey. Hello, everybody. Hello. 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 Hello.
I'm going to start charging money from the party line. Lord, 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 Lord,